I see a number of you have been here already, but let me just uh, remind you that Professor Arjen klein herrenbrink from the University of Radmond is uh, our speaker. And we, I think it's fair to say we've enjoyed uh, your past talks and we're looking forward to tonight. Um, uh, Arjen is a specialist in uh, speculative metaphysics and philosophical anthropology. Um, I think your, well, the book published in English by Edinburgh Press is called uh, Against Continuity, it's on Gilles Deleuze. And last time when we were having a casual conversation, you said maybe you, you have a book on philosophy of adventure? Yes, to, it's already be, out, in, it's out, it's out in Dutch and it might come out okay, in, in English, English as well. Yeah. for us, Mediterranean adventurers, we look forward to reading but Unfortunately, it. the title <laughs> will be Adventure Does Not Exist, so ah, it's going okay. to be a very... <laughs> Um, so tonight's uh, talk is called uh, Contemporary, so it's like an overview, Contemporary Continental uh, Metaphysics. And the only one usual thing which I have to mention is to put off your mobile, to put your mobiles on silent, because otherwise you know, it disturbs uh, the speaker. So thank you very much, and I'll leave it to you to it. Thank you, Claude, and thank you everyone for, for being here um, this evening. Um, as uh, just mentioned, this will kind of wrap up the entire uh, series of four talks that we've done here. Um, and so necessarily there is going to be some summary and some review and some building on uh, the previous lectures. But for those who were not there, I'll try to at least properly define any pieces of jargon and so on. But if you really lose track, um, well, tough luck. No, uh, just uh, just ask. Uh, just just uh, save your questions for the Q and A. Okay, so contemporary continental metaphysics. My um, my my main concern for for some years now has been metaphysics, specifically understood as our most general attempts to make sense of things, which is a definition coined by the British philosopher A. W. Moore. And my thesis is basically always that such an attempt should result in a theory that understands things in the sense of irreducible entities defined by powers that can manifest in space and time to other entities, but do not necessarily always need to do so. So entities can hold something in reserve. And this concern about metaphysics and this thesis about my about metaphysics are my two topics for this evening. First, I want to discuss why there is no escape from metaphysics, even though many 20th century philosophers have tried to declare it obsolete or pointless or meaningless or pretentious and so on. As we will see, Moore's definition helps to clarify why there is no getting rid of metaphysics. And that discussion will also feature some reflection on the renewed interest that we have seen amongst continental philosophers, the renewed interest in metaphysics during the last few decades, roughly since the turn of the millennium. That's going to be the first part. Uh, in the second part, I would like to elaborate on my view that when it comes to metaphysics, an ontology of entities defined in terms of their powers is probably the best game in town. Not the only game in town, but the best one. Uh, and of course, I'm not the only one who defends some version of a powers ontology. Notably, uh, Jane Bennett does this in her wonderful book, Vibrant Matter. Levi Bryant does it in his book, Onto Cartography. And as I argued earlier in this series of lectures, Deleuze and Gattari do the same in their collaborative work. And moreover, one of course should also not forget that there are strong power ontologies in analytical metaphysics, even if those are not the topic of this lecture series. In any case, my aim in the second part of the talk will be to discuss what I see as the merits of a powers ontology in the context of some considerations that arise from contemporary um, continental metaphysics. So first, why do metaphysics at all? And why not get rid of this archaic thing that was once considered the queen of the sciences? What is the point? Well, as you said, Moore defines metaphysics as the most general attempt to make sense of things. And this definition has distinct advantages over older characterizations of metaphysics as the search for first causes in reality, or the search for that which is unchanging and eternal. First of all, 
a theory obviously does not even need to posit a first cause, like an Aristotelian unmoved mover, or even eternal and unchanging entities in order to qualify as a metaphysics. Second, Moore's definition tacitly acknowledges something important, namely that there is no getting away from metaphysics. Human beings are creatures that can neither avoid making sense of things, nor can we avoid attempts to rank our making sense of things. Uh, academic philosophy does not even need to exist for such ranking to occur because candidates for the most general way in which you can make sense of things also emerge from the natural sciences, from history, religion, mythology, politics, the arts, and so on. So the idea that the only thing that ultimately exists is subatomic particles or fields or matter and energy is also an attempt at articulating the most general sense of things, even if it comes from physics. So is the idea that God has created reality and that everything in it unfolds according to his will. Even correlationism is ultimately a metaphysical theory, if we take Moore's definition seriously. So recall from one of the previous lectures that correlationism is the idea that you can only ever access thinking you yourself as a thinking creature and being, so the world around you, as a um, compound, as a correlate of each other. So you could only ever access your experiences of reality, never reality in and of itself, apart from the way that you are interpreting it, whether in visual perception or with a formula or through a bunch of labor laboratory equipment and so on. <clears throat> And this idea, as we have also discussed, could lead a strong correlationist, or what is called strong correlationism, to hold that talk about mind-independent entities really is meaningless, such that only the existence of the correlate, so that between space, between humans and worlds, and its contents could be affirmed as actually existing. So such correlationism does not posit first causes, or eternal entities, or even mind-independent things that exist when we're not looking at them, basically. And therefore, it's not metaphysics in the traditional sense. But it is metaphysics in Moore's sense, which I take to be the proper definition of metaphysics, because if correlationism is correct, right, if you could only ever think about that camera in terms of your experiences of that camera and never in terms of the camera in and of itself, if correlation is, is correct, then it would automatically follow that it does state the most general sense that can be made of things. Namely, things ought then to be understood as correlates between mind and world, not as mind-independent entities or as world-independent minds. And hopefully here you see why there is no escaping metaphysics. Right? You can, of course, argue that it is meaningless to debate what things ultimately are. You can argue that all the problems posed in metaphysics, in classical, traditional metaphysics, merely result from ambiguities inherent to our sloppy use of language, problems that would dissolve once we learn how to think properly. You can argue that all of our metaphysical theories are ultimately just instruments of power that religious or secular authorities use to justify their rule. You can even argue that the ultimate nature of things is a mystery that some divine entity forever hides from us. But in all those cases, you are still doing metaphysics because you are still articulating exactly what you take to be the most general sense that we can make of things. After all, even positing a limit beyond which such sense cannot be made is also to posit such a general sense. Huh. And to that, we should also add, no, not we, you don't need to agree, and to that I also want to add that the reputation of metaphysics as a discipline that merely deals in abstractions is undeserved. Right? In other words, metaphysics has real consequences and it is important that we pay serious attention to it. It matters a great deal whether a society 
takes reality to be governed, for example, by either a god or by impersonal natural laws. It will matter to how such a society organizes itself culturally, politically, religiously, economically. It will affect which kinds of institutions are deemed worthy of existence and support. It will influence how that society educates its children and because of all of that it will play a part in what kinds of human identities and ways of thinking it suppresses or encourages. In this sense the specific character of every society is in part a result of the struggles, tensions and compromises between various metaphysical ideas, right? If you've ever been to a theocratic country and right after that went on to visit an extremely secular country, you will know what I'm talking about. And this has also been shown decisively in Bruno Latour's reflections on modernity throughout his works, as also discussed in the previous lectures. Modern society partially owes its specific character to a specific metaphysics according to which the world, reality, consists of precisely two domains, ontologically different domains, nature on the one hand and culture on the other hand. Many aspects of our modern existence hinge on that understanding, ranging from how we have spent centuries treating our world as a mere pile of resources, to how we have spent those same centuries cultivating the notion of ourselves as rational and free citizen subjects with inalienable rights, to how we have organized our entire university system along that same distinction between natural sciences on the one hand and social sciences and the humanities on the other. Of course, it would be absurd to claim that all of modernity hinges on this metaphysics. That not, that's not how much power metaphysicians really have. Just like it would be absurd to claim that someone first invented a specific worldview which was then neatly implemented, as if building a world or culture is like assembling a piece of IKEA furniture by carefully following the instructions in the manual. Instead, my claim is simply that metaphysics is always among the threads that are woven into the fabric of a society. And that brings me to contemporary continental metaphysics. In 2011, so 11 years ago, a volume of essay essays edited by Levi Bryant, Nick Srenicek, I hope I pronounced it correctly, and Graham Harmon announced a speculative turn in continental philosophy pointing to a renewed interest in metaphysics roughly since the turn of the millennium. It designates authors that are either willingly or unwillingly and loosely or strongly associated with labels such as speculative realism, new materialism, and here in Europe also new realism. There is something strange about such a turn. After all, some of the most notable 20th century continental philosophers are already card-carrying metaphysicians, including Henri Bergson, Gilles Deleuze, and Alain Badiou. And that's just the French. So whence this idea of a speculative turn in the 21st century, as if the field somehow had to get back to metaphysics after straying? Well, the answer is that despite these kind of towering figures like Deleuze and Badiou, the mainstream of continental philosophy, so you know, mainly French and German inspired philosophy, was seen as increasingly embracing the idea that philosophy ought to merely concern cultural affairs, such as language, texts and discourse, social practices, power relations, moral injustices, identity struggles, and so on. And this tendency towards those kinds of analyses was in part the result of a certain suspicion that metaphysics was dead. Dead because proper metaphysics would not be possible, and it would not be possible because in the wake of figures like Heidegger and Derrida, according to some, the idea took hold that all metaphysics might come down to something called ontotheology or the metaphysics of presence. Hence, it would be best for philosophers to abandon all pretense of doing metaphysics and given that the natural sciences already laid claim to investigations of the non-human world restrict their research to the human sphere of linguistic, cultural and political affairs. <laughs>
In my view, then, the speculative turn should be seen as resulting from an increasing realization among continental philosophers that things were not all that bad, that the threat of ontotheology and metaphysics of presence turns out to not be all that serious. But since those two pieces of jargon might not be something that everyone is familiar with, some definitions are in order before we proceed. And let me um, here put in a disclaimer. Uh, the way I define these terms uh, is in ways that I personally find useful, so I'm not saying that what follows is in precise agreement with, for example, Heidegger, who might have the two terms referring to the exact same thing, whereas I think they're a bit different, and so on. In any case, here we go. When you accuse a metaphysician, so when you accuse Nicky, of practicing ontotheology, you accuse him of holding that all entities must ultimately be understood in terms of some supreme kind of being, regardless of whether that supreme being is God, a substance, a force, an energy, or whatever. And of course, you immediately notice ontotheology is only problematic if you think that there are very good reasons to think that reality cannot be reduced to such a single transcendent entity. Hence, the second accusation is the more serious one. When you accuse Nikki, when you accuse metaphysicians of practicing a metaphysics of presence, then you accuse it of ignoring our own human finitude, of claiming that all of reality can be surveilled from a universal and neutral point of view. You then accuse the metaphysicians of pretending that the very being of things can be made directly present to the mind without any interference from mediating factors, including the mind's own operations. If you take those two accusations seriously, it's a big if, but if you do, then you might want metaphysics to not be among the threads woven into the fabric of society. You might want to task philosophy with dismantling or deconstructing metaphysical theories or traces thereof wherever they are found. In that case, you may want to, for example, dedicate your research to revealing that uh, metaphysical theories at the end of the day only reflect and thereby legitimize existing power structures and hierarchies in society rather than being honest attempts at figuring out what things ultimately are. Now, as just said, I think that the speculative turn results from the increasing realization that these two problems, ontotheology, metaphysics of presence, so these two accusations, do not spell doom for metaphysics, or at least do not spell the end for metaphysics. Because first, as has been demonstrated in the previous lectures, metaphysical theories do not need to posit a single eternal transcendent entity that somehow lords over all being. Second, not all metaphysics needs to be metaphysics of presence, and that statement needs a bit of elaboration. So why, for example, do the three metaphysical theories discussed in this series, those of Deleuze, Latour, and Harman, not qualify as metaphysics of presence? The reason is that there is a difference between presence and existence. A metaphysics is a metaphysics of presence when it posits that whatever is ultimately real can be made directly present to the mind without any interference, without any distortion. This is neither the case for the Deleuzean virtual, which hides behind actuality, nor for the Latourian actor, which can only ever be translated rather than observed immediately, nor for the Harmanian real object, which withdraws from presence behind sensual surfaces. Or in more general terms, Theorizing something is not at all the same thing as making it present to consciousness. If you argue that reality is ultimately the virtual, or alternatively a manifold of real and sensual objects, then you are providing concepts for a reality that you are not making present thereby. For the same reason that thinking about Amsterdam does not make Amsterdam the actual city as such, present to your consciousness when you do so, right? What becomes present to your consciousness is a thought or a concept, not the object. 
However, someone might object that the accusation of a metaphysics of presence does not really concern the observers of real things, but the real things themselves. In other words, someone might object that certain metaphysical theories make entities far too present to themselves, far too compact, and then argue that such self-presence, such kind of being wrapped up in themselves, implies an overly static and atomistic worldview that ignores how dynamic, contingent, and connected the things of this world really are. Fair enough, I would say, but again, none of the theories discussed in the lectures so far fall prey to this kind of criticism, because Deleuzean virtuality, Deleuze-Guattarian machines, Latourian actors, and Harmanian objects are without exception contingent entities whose existence depends on other things and which can undergo real transformative change over the course of their existence. In other words, even if you haven't uh, been to the previous three lectures, the point is that the charges of ontotheology and the metaphysics of presence merely delineate what one might hold to be bad metaphysics and do not put a moratorium on metaphysics as such. And philosophers like Deleuze, like Badiou, saw this quite early and explicitly, well in Deleuze's case, explicitly stated that the so-called death of metaphysics never impressed him in the slightest. The rest of the field of continental philosophy just took a bit longer to catch up. And this catching up, I think, is one of the reasons why we see this rise in speculative realist, so speculative realist, new materialist, and new realist theories by authors including Ian Hamilton Grant, Kantem Meassou, Jane Bennett, Karen Barat, Timothy Morton, Tristan Garcia, Marcus Gabriel, and many others besides. I'm not going to do the entire list. In a sense, this whole development, this kind of return to metaphysics, also confirms what I said earlier in the context of Moore's definition of metaphysics. There is no getting away from the most general attempts to make sense of things. And that brings me to the second part of the lecture. If you kind of survey the metaphysical theories that have, remer have emerged sorry, under the rubrics of speculative realism, new materialism, and new realism, and if you take into account the most important precursor philosophers to those theories, then one interesting fault line, let's say, within that field concerns the question of whether or not a theory is ultimately, or should ultimately be a relationism. Should entities be defined in terms of their relations, yes or no? And I don't have time to discuss how every single one of the theories in these genres would be arranged along that fault line, but I can give some examples. The early Deleuze, as discussed in the first lecture, is clearly a relationist for two reasons. First, he holds that all actual entities, so all things that you see in occurring in space and time, are reducible to their virtual causes. Second, because he thinks that these virtual causes are ultimately elements that have no properties in and of themselves, themselves, because they are instead fully defined by their reciprocal determinations. Conversely, Graham Harmon, as also discussed in, the, in an earlier lecture, is clearly not a relationist, as he claims that real objects are withdrawn from how other entities relate to them. And he has repeatedly also stated that the world even is full of so-called dormant objects that neither relate to anything further nor perceive anything at all. Not all cases are so clear-cut, however. Latour, for example, is clearly a relationist when he defines actors in terms of how they modify, transform, perturb, or create other actors. That's him saying an entity is what it does to others. This is the side of Latour that I mostly focused on in one of the earlier lectures. But to be honest, at times he's also not quite such a relationist. For example, in The Prince and the Wolf, a published dialogue with Graham Harmon, in which Latour suddenly stresses that actors are irreducibly singular, and that no relation with or translation of an actor can ever empty its inner kernel, as Latour puts it. A similar ambiguity is present in Jane Bennett's book, Vibrant Matter. On the one hand, there, Bennett seeks to articulate what she calls thing power, 
which entails an ontology that defines all entities in terms of their affects. An affect being a capacity or a power to either affect something else or to be affected by something else. On the other hand, and at the same time, Bennett states that a disadvantage of that term thing power is its latent individualism, insofar as it suggests an atomistic rather than what she calls congregational understanding of agency. Agency, Bennett holds, is not ever a property or a capacity of an individual thing, but always distributed across a field of things. And a final example of where it gets more ambiguous is the work of Levi Bryant. In his earlier books, The Democracy of Objects and Onto Cartography, his ontology tends towards the Harmanian view of a discontinuous reality that consists of individual and irreducible entities. In recent years, however, Bryant seems to have moved towards a far more continuous view of a reality in which entities must be understood as folding and pleating themselves in and out of each other. So with such examples in mind, one can ask, as Jane Bennett does in a 2012 paper called Systems and Things, do we need to choose between objects and relations, between entities and what they engage with in the world? And the answer must, of course, in some sense be no, because things, as well as engagements between things, exist and are precisely what we are trying to explain or account for in metaphysics. But the challenge that Bennett's question implies is, of course, to articulate the being of entities and their relations in such a way that one is not lost in the other. And as I said in the introduction, I think that an ontology that defines things in terms of their powers is the best way to do that. So what follows will be heavily influenced by Bennett's ideas about thing power, by Bryant's initial power ontology, and by Deleuze and Gattari's notion of machines. But none of them would fully agree with my take on power ontologies. So let's say that all the good parts will be inspired by them, and I get to take full credit for any nonsense that may follow. Here we go. To start, I think that Graham Harmon's analysis of undermining and overmining is decisive. So that's going to be my point of departure. In incidentally, it's also interesting to note that Deleuze, already in the logic of sense, early 70s, also denounced versions of overmining and undermining, only he used different terms. He called it false height and false depth. But that's just an aside. Entities cannot be undermined, meaning reduced to more fundamental component parts because that ignores the existence of emergent properties. Second, entities cannot be overmined, meaning reduced to their effects on or functions in other larger entities or environments, because that would completely exhaust the full being of entities in their present or current state, such that change would be impossible. Hence, there must exist real entities that exist between those two levels that are irreducible to their parts or their actions or even to both. So in short, you, just like any other entity in this line of thinking, are not reducible to all your biological bits and you are also not reducible to everything that you do to other people and things because what you are lies between those things. You are something generated by your, by, by your um, biological parts, and you are something that generates actions in an environment. But we'll flesh that out. The advantage of defining all real entities, so humans as well as, well as non-humans, be they organizations or quarks, in terms of their powers, their capacities, their dispositions, is that for once you get to have your cake and eat it too. That is to say, with powers, you get to respect the fact that entities are irreducible, that they are really there making their own difference in reality, while also acknowledging that at every moment of their existence, they need relations with other entities in order to be the irreducible things that they are. That sounds like a bit of a contradiction, but it is not. 
So what are powers? Powers are what allow things to be affected and to affect others in particular ways. They are the things, the stuff, the substance, that the realities that we refer to with words like fragility or solubility. A glass vase, for example, is fragile in that it has the power or the capacity to break when struck. Sugar is soluble in that it has the power to dissolve in water. And you have the power or capacity or disposition to use language. A gun has the power to shoot bullets. A bird has the power of flight. Magnets have the power to attract or repulse other metals, and so on. Crucially, one important property of powers is that they do not need to manifest all the time. When they manifest, their manifestation is not even due to their own nature, but rather due to their engagements, uh, or the engagements of the parent entity, the one, the entity that has these powers, with other entities. In addition, the manifestation or actualization of a power is always a productive event. So when a power makes itself known, felt, and so on in reality, this is not a case of it, the power, making itself visible or tangible, as if you know, a curtain is ripped apart, is ripped to the side, and there you have this power. It is a case of that power producing something that is an expression of it, with that expression never being the power that it expresses. Simply put, when you speak a sent sentence in English, this expresses your linguistic powers, your li linguistic capacities, but that sentence is not such a power. That sentence is simply one of the indefinitely many ways in which you might actualize your power to speak English. Likewise, a vase that breaks expresses its fragility. It confirms that it has this power to break. But the empirical event of glass breaking is, of course, not itself a power. Right? These two features of power, of powers, first, that they need not be manifest all the time, and second, that manifestations are productions of something new, rather than simple presentations of powers, make clear that powers cannot be overmined into the effects that they have on others. In addition, powers can also not be undermined into their parts because they are emergent qualities. For example, salt is, of course, sodium chloride and it is soluble in water. But for silver chloride, this is not the case or barely the case. It cannot be solved in water. Hence, solubility is not a property of chloride, but in this example of the salt that the chlorides help constitute. It's a higher level property. Likewise, the capacity to speak a language is a power that must be ascribed to you and not to any of your biological or noological parts, just like the power to bestow doctorates or master degrees is a capacity of a university not a power belonging to any of its parts, right? I mean, uh, Claude can try to run around in the streets and give everyone that he likes <laughs> master's degrees and doctoral degrees, but it's not going to stick. Note, of course, that entities always mobilize their parts in order to express their powers, but that should not deceive us into thinking that these powers were really properties of these parts all along, even before they ended up in the entities whose powers they currently help express. So powers cannot be overmined or undermined, but that necessitates, that also necessitates, some brief reflection on how we conceptualize powers when we want to think about them. After all, one consequence of not being able to overmine powers is that they cannot be reduced to our knowledge of them, right? They cannot be reduced to how we experience them. Hence, at first sight, because of this, a powers ontology seems to evoke some very strange questions when it comes to what we can know about powers. For example, does a fragile glass have one power of fragility or several? Is the power to break when struck with a baseball bat different from the power to break when pushed off a table? Or take a ship, 
Does a ship have the power to transport passengers and then a separate power to transport cargo? Or does it simply have a single power to transport stuff? Do I have a power to speak Dutch and another power to speak English? Or just a single power to speak a language or to speak languages, to use languages? And is my power to use language distinct from perhaps another power to acquire language in the first place? And that, 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 these questions drive you to despair because then we seem to kind of fall back into these medieval scholastic metaphysical problems of how many angels can you fit on the head of a pin and so on. But such confusion, such, not confusion, such confusing questions are provoked by the fact that powers do not neatly align with their manifestations and with our descriptions of them. Right? So they are expressed without that expression ever being identical to them. And by the fact that powers are never directly present to consciousness, precisely because we only ever have direct contact with their manifestations. Hence, our knowledge of powers is never completely exact. This is why Deleuze and Gattari call our knowledge of powers of things in themselves an exact, not inexact, but an exact. As they write, in order to designate something exactly, exact expressions are utterly unavoidable. That sounds like typical postmodern um, um, not horseshit, but what they mean is this. No exact expression of powers is possible because, for example, you cannot give a list, you cannot generate a list of every single written or spoken sentence that my linguistic capacities may allow for. First, because that list is indefinitely long. Second, because my linguistic powers can change over time, so that as soon as you would complete, hypothetically, this impossible list, my actual powers may no longer align with the definition that you have just produced, or the representation that you have just produced. So what is an anexact expression? An anexact expression is a description that is accurate without being complete. To say that I have the power to speak English is accurate, but it doesn't give you a complete definition of that power. Likewise, you can express the capacity of a certain substance to dissolve in different graphs and formulas. For example, you can use the noise whitney uh, or Noyes, I don't know how to pronounce it, Whitney equation, to relate the rate of dissolution of a solid to the properties of that solid and the medium in which it is dissolving. That equation is, without doubt, an accurate formula, but it doesn't tell you everything there is to say about a certain power of solubility. For example, it doesn't tell you how the solubility of a substance changes if it undergoes a phase shift from a solid to a liquid. Right, because this equation only applies to how solids dissolve. Hence, in Deleuze and Gattari's term, the equation is accurate but inexact. It describes what a thing can do under certain, cer certain circumstances, but it doesn't describe everything that a thing can do. And the point here is this. The fact that we can ask many questions, some completely sensible, others seemingly absurd, about the precise nature, quantity, and quality of powers of entities does not point to a flaw in the theory of powers. Rather, it confirms the fact that powers are irreducible to their manifestations and descriptions, the fact that they might change over time, and the fact that our minds and theories do not have direct, unmediated access to the very being of things. And one could add that this is precisely one of the reasons why experimental science is so useful. Quite simply put, given an occurring effect X and the presence of three entities, A, B, and C, which one really has the power to produce X here? Well, that hap well, we can see what happens if we remove C, retain A, and also remove B. But what happens if we put B back into the mix? What happens if we keep A, but this time combined with element D and E instead of B and C, and so on? Such experimental labor is precisely intended to uncover not only which powers exist, but also to, de to determine, as precisely as possible, the entities to which they ought to be ascribed. 
So to sum up the argument to the, up to this point, entity defined as powers are in line with the impossibility of undermining and overmining, and the impossibility of overmining the powers of entities entails that they are also irreducible to our knowledge of the or theories about them, hence the necessity for a concept like an exactitude, which means accuracy without exhaustive description. To this, I would like to add the following. Power ontology itself never tells you whether or not specific kinds of entities exist. And this is something that is often left understated in contemporary continental metaphysics, especially in object-oriented ontologies and in variants of new materialism. Because in these theories, a very, very, very wide range of entities, including material, organic, and social ones, are often used in examples to illustrate certain points. But we must recall that these kinds of ontologies, power ontologies or not, do not immediately, it automatically, allow you to say that, for example, social objects like organizations really exist as irreducible units. It may very well be that a social object such as Microsoft really exists as an autonomous agency over and above its parts, but it may also be just shorthand for the operations of an aggregate of, associate, of associated entities beyond which nothing more, such as the overarching thing Microsoft, would exist. So all that a power ontology is committed to is that there are certain strong indicators for when there is a real entity. These include the apparent presence of emergent properties over and above the properties of individual parts. They also include retroactive effects on parts, as for example, when an army starts to alter the identities of the very people that constitute it by becoming soldiers. It also includes the production of new entities that would not exist without this entity, as when a factory produces items that none of its components could produce individually. And it includes the acquisition of further powers in addition to existing ones, as when a human being uses their linguistic powers to acquire a second or third language. But in each of these cases, a certain principle of detection is asserted as a fruitful way to start investigating what kinds of entities really exist. But the examples given of universities, of armies, and so on, are preliminary and initially to be taken only as illustrations. That is to say, even though I personally suspect that these principles suffice to assert the full reality and ontological dignity of physical, organic, and social entities, this is open to counterfactuals and refut uh, refutations. All that a power ontology really insists on is that whatever real entities exist behind the everyday manifestations of things, those entities are defined as powers. But let's return to that fault line of relationism that I mentioned earlier. My claim was that powers give us the golden mean, so to speak, between the irreducibility of objects and the obvious significance of relations. This is because powers, despite the fact that they cannot be undermined into their components, do need components to generate and regenerate them. And at this point, we can make an interesting myriological observations. Our usual thinking about entities precludes their environments from counting as their parts. So in everyday language, my brain counts as one of my parts. My hand counts as one of my parts. But the book that I might be reading does not count as one of my parts. In a power ontology, you need to let go of that way of thinking almost as if it's an optical illusion. Because ontologically speaking, all that is inside an entity is its powers. Everything else is external to it, simply something connected to it. And this means that what we normally call the parts of an entity are just as far removed, in an ontological sense, from its inner being as what we normally call its environment. Conversely, environments are just as much parts of entities as what we normally call their parts. 
insofar as they too help produce the powers of things. Therefore, in this context, it is better to speak of generators than of parts. Right? My brain generates and regenerates certain powers that I have, but so do the books that I read, the food that I eat, the oxygen that I breathe, the social relations that I entertain with other people, and so on. So, powers exist only insofar as they are produced and then reproduced by entities that serve as generators for a parent entity. This entails a disagreement with Harman's object-oriented ontology. Insofar as I do not think that objects are ever fully dormant, Harman and I both agree that entities do not necessarily need to have effects on anything else. No real object needs to be registered as this or that sensual object, and likewise no powers need to be expressed or manifest to anything else. And when that happens, it's contingent, not necessary. But Harman also holds that an object itself does not need to perceive anything at all. If I am correct, that would mean that dormant objects, what he calls dormant objects, do not just evade being registered by other entities, but also register no other entities themselves. In a powers ontology, that's impossible. Um, any given power must have a generator even though these generator are open to multiple realization. This means that the initial support for your, let's say, linguistic powers may include textbooks, conversations, and so on, but the role that these generators initially play can later on be replaced by neurons, memories, and so on. But without any generators and regenerators whatsoever, powers perish, and without powers, entities perish. Does that entail that a power ontology regresses into an undermining position? It doesn't, because powers are emergent properties with regards to generators that produce them. If humans have linguistic powers, then the brains, textbooks, conversations and memories that produce and reproduce them neither have these powers themselves, nor are they such powers themselves. In short, powers are different in kind from their generators, and that suffices to preclude undermining. That's one. Another difference with Harman's theory is that a power ontology allows for gradual yet real transformative change, whereas according to Harman, objects only ever undergo significant symbiotic transformations. A single conversation in a new language that I am just starting to learn may induce a slight but nevertheless real change to my powers just like a sudden traumatic accident may cause significant real change by nearly destroying my linguistic powers altogether. And again, this does not dissolve powers into the thousands of waxing and waning relations that their parent entities entertain with their external environments because powers are still different in kind from the entities that produce them, no matter how numerous these entities are. Now. To wrap up, there are two further points to be made about understanding entities in terms of powers. The first is a worry sometimes raised by Harman, namely that despite everything just said, powers would ultimately still be too relational to avoid overmining. The worry is that defining entities in terms of their potential simply means that we define them in terms of future actions, in terms of what they might someday do and since that would still entail defining entities in terms of their effects on others, it would be a case of overmining. And there I disagree, mostly because of what I said earlier about anexact expressions. So let's take the expression, to have an example, Mary can jump very high. That is indeed a relational definition, because the terms jump and high are only intelligible in a world where Mary is not the only existing entity, right? If you imagine a void in which nothing exists except poor Mary, there is nowhere for her to jump, let alone no you know, point of comparison that you can use to say, oh, that jump was very high. Hence, Mary can jump very high, the statement, tacitly refers to the existence of other entities that Mary will relate to if and when she indeed jumps very high. But the whole point about powers 
is that they exist even if they are not expressed. So even if Mary never jumps even once in her life, she can still have the power that the sentence Mary can jump very high refers to. Powers are irreducible to their relational activation even if human language can only describe them in relational terms, which is to say, which is to say, and exactly. And also notes that the same is true for the real qualities that Harman himself takes to characterize real objects, right? According to Harman, real qualities can only be alluded to, uh, sorry, real objects can only be alluded to and real qualities can only be approached theoretically. Power descriptions are also theoretical allusions to the real power of entities, not exhaustive descriptions of necessary manifestations. Hence, powers themselves are not reducible to the relational presence of the manifestations that express them. That's the first point. My second and final point concerns Bennett's, Jane Bennett's worry that defining things in terms of powers suggests a kind of individualism that would not really exist as agency would not be a property um, of individuals, but always a property distributed across a field. In my view, that objection or that worry conflates several things that we could um, you know, unentangle, if that is a word. First, it is obviously the case, disentangle, that we could disentangle. First, it is obviously the case that most events are indeed the result of various entities acting in concert. No knife can cut without the presence of another object that is being cut. Second, it is also the case that no entity has powers in and of itself, such that multiple other entities are needed to generate its powers. No knife can cut without the metals that constitute its blade. No metals can constitute a blade without the labor of a smith. No smith can forge a blade without the appropriate tools, and so on. But from these two points, it does not follow that no individual entity has individual powers. In fact, in order for such aggregate effects or collective efforts to be possible in the first place, it is even necessary that whatever entities contribute to it have their own properties, their own real powers. By analogy, playing a wonderful symphony is obviously a collective effort whereby the relevant agency, so the act of playing the symphony, is distributed across a field of musicians and instruments that are all doing their part. But for that to be possible, for it to be possible that the symphony is played, every musician and every instrument must of course itself be capable of doing something. Not playing the symphony, but something. Otherwise the ontological scaffolding needed for events to occur in the first place would be missing. And with that, I would like to conclude. So I try to make two points this evening. First, that we cannot escape from metaphysics defined as the most general attempt to make sense of things. And since we're stuck with metaphysics, we might just as well try to get good at it. Second, that in my view, a power ontology is the best candidate for metaphysics. Power ontologies stay well within the theoretical bandwidth, so to speak, that remains once undermining and overmining positions are ruled out. Power ontologies are, in addition, also in a Goldilocks position where the irreducibility of entities can be affirmed while also acknowledging that entities absolutely need mutual relations to maintain their existence because powers need generators to produce and reproduce them. On that note, thank you very much. Thank you.